First, I need to say how delighted I am to be here, and um, I need to thank several people for making that possible. First of all, of course, my sincere thanks to the Israeli Association for Japanese Studies, and of course, in particular, to Professor Kovner uh, and to Dr. Uh, Martel uh, for their part in organizing this incredible program, which I think will be a milestone conference, um, probably the first. Um, we've all decided that we'll look at the Heisei in retrospect. And of course, I want to say a special thanks to Dr. Zohar for uh, her invitation to participate in this panel. Now, my topic, Godzilla's Children, Takashi Murakami, Makoto Aida, and Tabaimo the unholy trinity of horror, violence, and the grotesque in the Heisei era uh, is a challenge that I may not be able to deliver to your satisfaction, but we, we will do the best that we can. I do want to warn you, I know in this age of sensitivities that many of these images would be, are very graphic, possibly offensive, sexually explicit, violent. So please, if you are offended uh, or think you might be, maybe you <laughs> might go to the other, <laughs> the other panel. So what am I doing? Well, I'm going to read this paper. I hope it won't be, don't start to drone on. Just you know, give me a, a shout out to wake up, okay. Dystopia, apocalyptic war, Galactic images, technological nightmares have come to dominate the popular culture of the Heisei era. As part, an emphasized part, of what has become an international phenomenon, all you have to do is walk out the corridor and see the images of students on the wall right outside this classroom to justify that. Um, if not, just simply part of this phenomenon, it may actually be one of its main contributing sources. The spectacles of exploding violence and mayhem that run amok in Japanese film, anime, and video, um, as these examples, they might, they're better showing on your screen than mine here. Um, they appear also in contemporary Japanese art. So in this paper, I want to explore the violent images of three major artists of the Heisei era. We've already named them, Murakami, Aida, and Tabaimo. Two men and a woman. Three separate strategies of artistic expression that push the boundaries of contemporary high art toward horror, violence, and the grotesque and I will attempt to situate their work within the contours of late 20th and 21st century Japanese history and popular culture. This is a complex hermeneutical project which requires multiple analytical tools to question the ontological and symbolic meaning of violence, the distinction between real and virtual violence, the representation of violence, and whether the difference even matters. Eros, pornogra pornography, the intersections of pain and pleasure, the aestheticization of violence, dystopia and its handmaidens, the absurd and the grotesque. This short paper introduces the topic and suggests a platform for understanding by using Murakami, Ida, and Tabaimo as convenient if obvious points of entry each artist is born in the 1960s and 70s and is a pure product of late Showa Japan, of post-war, post-fascist, post-occupation Japan, artists who have come of age in the Heisei period. As members of this generation, born well after the end of the Pacific War into an increasingly affluent, peaceful, and technologically advanced society, in their youth and adolescent comfort, these artists enjoyed access to a rich commercial world of visual imagination and experimentation already explored in 
and with increasing sophistication in manga, film, and television, creating worlds that um, <clears throat> are multiple forms of apocalyptic comedy, I might add, dystopia, recall the pre-war taste for erotic, grotesque nonsense, critical concepts explored in, de in depth by Mark Driscoll and Miriam Silverberg. Nor can we ignore the actual violence of the Heisei era or the litany of ills that afflict Japanese society, many already thoroughly discussed in this very conference. Economic collapse, unemployment and homelessness, low birth rates, declining libidos, an aging society, signs of the breakdown of traditional social practices, anarchy and chaos in the schools, brutal, senseless crimes, some committed by mere children, devastating natural disasters like the great eastern Japan earthquake and the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the threat of North Korea, the emergence of serial killers and mass murderers, fringe religious groups like the Aum Shinrikyo, calling for Armageddon in 19, 1995 with a sarin gas attack in the Tokyo subways and on and on and on. Spectacles of real violence, of course, do not need the graphic imagination of artists high or low to be experienced. I hope to show, by this way, this is a still from one of the films called Battle Royale, which is a contest among high school students um, and then of which only one is possible to emerge alive at the end of the contest, sort of a, a precursor to the, the Hunger Games, as it often pointed out. So I hope to show how Japanese artists like Murakami, Aida, and Tobaimo have seized and isolated this violence, recontextualized and aestheticized it in subversive ways, and literally enlarged its scale to an unprecedented monumentality and in so doing, they have raised erotic, grotesque nonsense from the lower depths of popular entertainment and amusement to the arguably higher plane of the art gallery and the public art museum. First, for deeply personal and individual reasons. For instance, Makoto Aida has been recorded as saying, since I was a kid, I always doubted that the way people work and live today is the right way. It's also one of the reasons why I am an artist. Similarly, Tabaimo, speaking of her work, says, my work details fears, emotions, and feelings that I have under my skin, very personal sensations made visible that bring out things which are in my body to the surface. But ultimately, and primarily, I believe, these artists are creating work primarily to honor and assert and express the reality, their reality, invite us, and invite us to share it. So I'm going to start with the concept of grotesque nonsense. And uh, for that, I'll turn to Takashi Murakami. And he is perhaps the most analytical, theor theoretically based, and art historically situated artist of the three, making his debut in Los Angeles with the shockingly graphic works like My Lonesome Cow Cowboy, of which, do, which Dr. Zohar has already written. Uh, and publicly and outspokenly, he has linked um, the uh, violence and breakdown of Japanese society or alternately tied the exposure of the sacred myths of the homogeneous, peaceful Japanese society directly to the American bombings of Japan in the Pacific War and the occupation that followed. In his introduction to the catalog essay for his 2005 exhibition, Little Boy, Japan Exploding Subculture, held at the Japan Society in New York, he identifies the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki 
in August of 1945 as the source of the original trauma, the unhealed and unhealable wound, the single malformative event of the new Japan that exploded from the ashes of Japanese cities. So the winding gyre of the irrational having reached its outer limits in atrocities of living memory is returning to the center. He theorized that, this is by the way his um, images from the exhibition, uh, the catalog, the cover of the catalog and one of the posters announcing the exhibition. I'd like you in particular to look at his, his, um, his representation of the mushroom cloud as a cute object. We'll have more to say about that in a minute. Um, uh, Murakami theorizes that MacArthur's infantilization of Japan during the occupation produced monstrous, grotesque progeny like Godzilla and the empty superficiality of contemporary Japanese society, exemplified by the phenomenon that we know as the otaku culture. Uh, and here you see examples of sort of caricatures of the otaku who who in his, in his room surrounds himself by video games and, and soft pornography. Um, and Murakami has identified, I've lost the text at the top there for some reason, I identified the great television uh, fantasy, the Neon Genesis Evangelion uh, by Hideko Anno in 1995 as the the greatest um, unsurpassed milestone in the history of otaku culture. And I'd like to take just a moment to, to look for a few minutes at um, a piece from the Neon Genesis Evangelion. And here they are, all of the characters of that. Themes are mecha, um, post-apocalyptic violence, and adolescent sexuality. Has anyone, is anyone familiar with Yay, all right, one or two. Well, thank you. Um, I am going to, to, yes, and I hope it's not going to scream too loudly. Uh, I didn't just want to preface this by saying, within here, there's this magnificent scene of choreographed, the avas are these meccas that are, that are operated by the adolescent saviors of the world, these young girls and boys who are the focus of the story. And they are going to be protecting the earth, the world, against these invasors called angels. So the two of them will do this highly choreogra choreographed death scene in which they, they inflict the ultimate death on the angels. And don't, please don't ask me to explain more than that. So um, Murakami's most potent vehicles of the absurd are his twin strategies. First, what I have, what I have coined a term, I don't know if this will work or not, but the kawaii-fication of horror uh, and its counterpart, the horrification of kawaii, a strategy he shares with Yoshitomo Nara, if you're familiar, familiar with that artist, and um, whose images I would, I would um, bring in as a fourth uh, person in, in this uh, discussion, if it could be longer. Um, he trans, for instance, Murakami transforms the mushroom cloud into a cute benevolent genie that floats in a clear blue sky or expose, or in this other strategy, the horrification of the kawaii, he exposes the vicious potential that lurks in adorable playthings and playmates. Uh, and more recently in his uh, work of the 500 arhats, he has kind of left those strategies behind to um, be replaced by more um, interest in the raw power of the grotesque on a grand psychedelic scale. So on to the erotic grotesque, which brings us to Makoto Aida, born in 1965. Like American pop artists of the 1960s, more, most noticeably Roy Lichtenstein, whose, whose source were romantic comic books, but with arguably more cynical and subversive intentions, Ida, now in his late 40s, boldly and unapologetically appropriates the shock and awe of violent Japanese popular films like The Battle Royale and the sexuality 
uh, of anime and manga that we see, you know, in these, um, what are they, which are images for otaku, two-dimensional and three-dimensional, highly sexual, sexualized uh, young girls uh, that explore the aesthetic of moe, budding eroticism. Um, so again, the return of the battle royale. So there's a whole po po level of popular culture, uh, including the film, uh, the, uh, the anime, Akira of 1988, Ghost in the Shell, which has recently be been remade with Scarlett Johansson, uh, starring as, um, uh, as the primary um, heroine, in which gory dismemberment, sadistic murder, and masochistic self-mutilation celebrate the triumph of the irrational and reveal the dark underside and, and uh, post-apocalyptic fears of contemporary Japanese society. Ida recalls the moment in 1989, the first year of Heisei, when he made the connection between grotesque violence, abjection, and eroticism, which led him to create his well-known series, Dog, capital D-O-G. This is actually Dog Snow of 1996. He says you can read it. Um, he, I suddenly felt the necessity of expressing an original Japanese eroticism. And in his mind, he had images of Yasunari Kawabata-like world in which hunchbacked elderly person kept a small bird. So something of the grotesque. I had almost never before worked with such an attitude of considering what the psychological effects on the viewer might be. And around this time uh, on that I'd finished this painting, um, the Tomo Miyazaki incident was brought into light. Now I'll pause for a moment just to remind you of what that was, uh, Tsutomo Miyazaki, 1962 to 2008, also known as the otaku murderer, was a serial killer, cannibal, and necrophile who abducted and murdered little girls in Saitama and Tokyo between 1988 and 1999. So he is clearly bringing together a lot of very grotesque, erotic, um, let's say, um, indecent, horrific subject matter together in, in a very blatant and unapologetic way. Uh, his, one of his most sort of iconic pieces is this gigantic billboard um, size image, which has a long, long title, Gigantic Member Fuji Attacked, attacked by King Ghidorah of 1993. Uh, he acknowledges his debt to manga anime and also to hokusai. And he writes, and I'll just read this quickly, both shunga and manga are closely connected with people's uh, often indecent tastes and therefore it can't get acknowledged as art. Yet they are the most honest and original form of visual expression for the Japanese people. It has been a pending question for me how to establish a style of painting that could bridge the two genres. I found Hokusai's work harmonized well with the monsters from the Godzilla movies and with the female character from the TV drama Ultraman. So I replaced the octopus with King Ghidorah and made my work into the style of and with the materials used in anime so as to make a huge celluloid picture. Oh, the I had it there for you, sorry. So he combines the King Ghidorah monster from one of the Godzilla films of 1964 and the female character from the Ultraman television series giant member Fuji to bring that together with the hoax size um, uh, pornographic image of the, the um, fisher, fisherman's wife and the uh, octopus. So also in one of his uh, iconic images, Harakiri Schoolgirls of 1999-2002 is like a still from Battle Royale. He has this to say, some of my pictures, did I bring that for you? No. Some of my pictures are a bit like billboards. 
at least they're very large, and I created them with the idea that they would be rather like monuments that people would see from far away as they do billboards. For precisely that reason, I was looking to have them exhibited in a public space like an art museum where anyone who pays the entry fee can go in and see them. So other images, tremendously violent and in somewhat horrific images, if not, in, not immediately obvious at close, closer re range become so. Here is uh, from a major exhibition he had at the Mori Art Museum in 2012 called Monument for Nothing. Subtitle is Please Forgive Me for My Genius. Uh, I know, he's, you know he, he's not shy either about his abilities. Um, and here is the, the blender, and as you can see from the scale that we saw previously, it's a huge, um, I don't know, is this a wearing blender? I think I have one of these in my kitchen, almost identical to this, filled with, with the, the bodies of women, the nude bodies of young women. Um, this perhaps is the closest he is coming, this and the, the Ash Mountain, in which is he's most overtly political and uh, social in his commentary. Here is a, a detail. He's, he's really an amazingly gifted painterly painter. I mean, he's, he's graduate of Tokyo uh, University of uh, Music and Fine Arts, uh, Gay Dai in Tokyo. So he's, he had a really important classical education. Uh, and there's a close-up of the Ash Mountain. Uh, and again, I bring back the statement that I partially read earlier. Since I was a kid, I always doubted that the way people work and live today is the right way. This work, specifically Ash Mountain and the others, came from that doubt. It's also one of the reasons why I'm an artist. This said, I really don't know why they are there. Who are they, these bodies of salarymen that are piling up? In my imagination, they fall from the sky one by one and pile up like sand forming huge mountains like this. And here are details. Uh, as you get closer and closer, you see he's painted thousands of individualized figures of discarded, disposable, working class people who are just literally now on the ash heap of life. So this is certainly talking about unemployment, about economic failure, about the changes in the, the traditional system of lifetime employment, and various other things. Five minutes, that's all I need. Erotic, grotesque nonsense. Okay, this brings us to the last, Tabaimo. Uh, born in 1975, who was a teenager at the beginning of the Heisei. She's already in her early 40s. One of several successful women artists of her generation who work in video installation, which by the way represents a turn away from the traditional static images of painting to newer, more dynamic forms of image making that take advantage of time-based electronic media. This combined with the heroic scale of her work, again really monumental, serves to immerse the viewer in an alternate virtual reality in which everyday spectacular horrors that lie beneath the surface of polite Japanese society become visible. Uh, and her, probably her, her very earliest piece uh, is called Japanese Kitchen, and this was remarkably her, her graduation piece from her, her first art degree. Um, she, her, her work is very experimental, experiential and demanding. Uh, video installation is, a, requires a serious investment on the part of the viewer. The media of vi video installation is in inherently controlling and does not allow the viewer to make decisions about where to look or where to focus like painting does. So it is difficult to represent video installations in stills. I'm sorry, um, I was defeated by my technical disabilities uh, to be able to get her videos up uh, like I have the um, Neon Genesis. Um, but this Japanese kitchen, and I'll finish with this piece. Uh, here viewers have an opportunity to enter a narrow wooden structure like this one with tatami mats uh, and shoji. And in, when they open the inside, they see that several video screens are playing an, a loop installation which show familiar domestic scenes of housewives cooking in the kitchen, 
who the atmosphere is one of estrangement and unease and incongruity with unsettling images of murder, brains cooking on the stovetop that appear throughout the work, a politician campaigning inside a microwave oven, an old woman chanting sutras inside a pickle jar, salary men at his desk in, in a fridge. Uh, finally, Don Don of 2002 is a similar installation in which she shows the interior of an apartment house, and this is a constantly moving, um, a constantly moving stream of images in which she wants to talk about these spaces, uh, and um, she's showing a slight warping and a slight difference of paradox of what is going on in it, always creating a sense of, of anxiety and an imminent danger. Uh, and the last image shows still from this series called Don Don. And this is the murder room. And like Ida, she is influenced by the uh, graphic crimes that are committed in Heisei, Japan, or earlier. Uh, this is an incident that took place in August in 1985, in which um, uh, uh, the president of the Toyota Shoji, an investment group, uh, built people out of 202 billion yen with some fraud. And um, in revenge, a couple of workers murdered him. But before they murdered him, stabbed him to death, they notified the media, who all appeared and caught it on camera. And these images were actually shown on Japanese television. So she's talking about how she, um, the, the fact that we live in an internet society where we don't really even know what goes on next door with our neighbors. So in conclusion, I want to return to the very beginning and just say that Murakami, Ida, and Tabaimo have seized and isolated recontextualized, aestheticized, and monumentalized the violence in contemporary Japan in subversive yet seductive ways, raising erotic, grotesque nonsense from the realm of pulp fiction to the heights of the fine arts, to honor and express their individual realities, and perhaps to challenge ours. Thank you. <laughs>